good day all and it is a good day if you like volatility all over the map today uh, of course we'll talk about that and the reasons why and uh, maybe how we might end the day but as we start our live stream here the dow is down 0.22 percent having made it from the depths of mortar <laughs> back to the plus side s p is down 0.83 slipping backwards as that composite down 1.44 percent also slipping backwards after having tried to come off the bottom so we'll talk about exactly how low we got and levels to watch because as interesting as today is it also may be telling we are going to keep an eye obviously throughout the day, but certainly into the close to see what we do. Markets are jittery and they have been jittery since last making highs on, on September 2nd. Uh, the NASDAQ composite made a new high, the S&P 500 made a new high, the Dow Jones Industrial Average got above 29,000 to 29,100 that day. And then of course we know what happened the following day, just, the bottom fell out and we've been struggling ever since what happened today is a function of what happened yesterday the sell-off began yesterday uh on based really on what investors didn't understand that chairman jerome powell was saying in his comments and at the presser answering questions it was fairly clear to everybody it's certainly clear to me and it should be clear to you that the fed is keeping rates lower for longer there's no there's no there's no hidden message there there's nothing there it's it, that it is what it is so keeping rates lower for longer we knew that that was the statement that we got last time and it was i'm going to read you the quote because i copied this down last time and what's interesting about it is let me see if I can find it because it was um, it, it's very telling as to what exactly the Fed's feeling is. Um, so they basically said last time, last uh, coming out of the last FOMC meeting, um, that they would keep rates lower for longer and um, th until they were confident the economy has weathered recent events and is on track to achieve the central bank's inflation and employment goals. Okay, got that? Pretty straightforward. So what happened yesterday? Nothing, nothing new. It's really more of the same, a reiteration of that policy. The only thing that happened yesterday was uh, some further explanation of the inflation target. And the inflation target is a moving target now. It was 2% before, now it is going to be an average of 2%. So that means they have carte blanche to see interest rates continue to fall, push them down. And as long as interest rates are low and we don't see crazy inflation, which we don't know what that means, they're gonna to continue to keep rates low, at least through 2023. So what does that mean? It means if you're targeting 2%, that's 2%. You get there, then you've got to worry about, do we need to start raising rates because inflation is starting to percolate. Now what they're saying is, we're gonna make it an average of 2%. Okay, how do you define an average of 2%? Is it over a couple of quarters? Is it over over a couple of years? So if inflation, however they want to measure it, the CPI or uh, CPE, the, the if interest rates could stay low in spite of the fact that we see inflation um, on the personal consumption expenditures measure go to 3%, 4%, 5%. But if they go back as far as they want to go and say, well, the average now going back to, oh, 2017 is a good bit less than 2%, then they can just keep moving that target. So investors didn't like that, didn't understand what that really meant. And they didn't like the fact that the Fed basically and the members of the FOMC expressed uncertainty about the direction of the recovery. 
and they, but there was no unanimity in terms of expressions of, of confidence. Uh, and, and I think that spooked investors to some degree. So markets start to sell off yesterday. And that by the end of the day, there was some, um, shall we say, consternation um, in markets. And the Dow, having had a really great day, being up at one point, 343 points came back down and closed up just 36 points. So that's a big drop for the Dow. Uh, the S&P ended the day down 0.46%. And the NASDAQ composite ended the day down 1.25%. So coming in today, obviously the futures were had been beaten up um, as investors tried to digest overnight really what the Fed was saying and what it meant for equities, what it meant for interest rates, and really where was the economy. Into that, we never knew we had initial claims coming this morning, continuing claims, et cetera. So what did they do? They did, they took the path of least resistance, which over the last two weeks has been to the downside. And it was easy for investors to look to take some profits. Really, they're not even taking profits. They're just really hedging in that case if they're selling the futures um, in order to hedge against profits they may have or simply to make bets that the markets are going to open lower and probably continue lower. So you short the future. So you had a, a lot of futures shorting and that's obviously what pushes the futures down. So as other investors see that, they want to hedge against the market opening lower and continuing lower, so they start to sell. So the futures coming into the open were, were pretty badly bruised, and we just gapped down. We're going to take a look at some of these gaps um, as far as this morning goes. Um, but more importantly, we're going to take a look at where the benchmarks are now, where the leading stocks are, and how we look. We're going to find out, um, as we've been talking about the last couple of sessions, that we are still outside of the uptrending channels that markets had been in and we are desperately struggling to get back up there and as of today i would say failing somewhat miserably how miserably will well, that be a function of how we end the day so certainly going to get into all of that uh, but we are slipping backwards now so we had the retail in the morning. You had investors in the morning positioning themselves, selling stuff. So retail started to sell in the morning, but not a lot. It was because the market gapped down so much, there wasn't a lot of chances to sell. And so I think what happened really is there was just a bit of like, well, what now? Let's just see how low this goes. And when things didn't really just tumble out of bed, there was certainly selling going on there, but not to the extent that I expected. And the volume um, certainly... Uh, confirms that there was it, it wasn't heavy selling, so we're seeing this constantly now. We're seeing a lot of selling being done before the open in terms of the futures, and then when we gap down, a lot of times there's like, well, I, I may be waiting to sell because everything's already lower, and what happens then? We fill that gap and we move maybe a little bit higher, or we there's no great panic. That's been happening considerably more than it has for many, many years, even though it does happen. It's happening more frequently now than ever before. We're seeing that on the upside. Markets are gapping up and investors, because they're more bullish investors out there, and certainly I'm talking about the retail crowd for the most part, when markets gap up, they don't hesitate to jump in. So markets gap up and retail investors jump in, moving them even higher. So you have this nice push to the upside, but it doesn't really impact so much to the downside yet. We haven't gotten to a place where those retail investors that have been pushing the market higher since the lows in March have panicked. Um, they're not all making money, but a lot of them have made money. A lot of them feel that they have a pretty good handle on how to trade the markets now because, well, they've been successful and hats off to them. We're going to get to a point we may be there where they're going to be tested and this is what i've been talking about in terms of where we are in terms of retail's importance and impact on the markets so i'll start by saying if retail is has led the markets higher eventually causing institutional investors to chase up the stocks that retail was buying and pushing higher because 
institutional investors can't be on the sidelines when markets are making new highs. They've got to jump in and say, yes, we own that too. And look on our performance, we're up also. So the retail really led the way. It was the tail wagging the dog. And on the downside, we don't really see that yet. Institutions are doing some hedging in here but they're not selling. They're waiting for retail to come in and see if retail is going to take markets back up. Institutional investors going into the election, given the tumult in the markets over the last week, are not going to lead markets higher. They are not going to commit new capital, take sideline money and put it in to buy right in here and try and move the markets higher. They're just too conservative to do that. There's no need for them to do that, especially as markets have increased, their uh, volatility has increased, and we've started to slide a little bit. So we're not going to see a push higher from institutions. They're waiting to see if they have to come in to chase retail up. Retail looks like it's getting heavy on their shoulders, and they're not buying these dips. Did they buy this dip this morning? Yes, there were people that bought this dip this morning. Absolutely, people bought the dip this morning. That's how we ended up coming back to the plus side on the Dow. That's how we ended bouncing off the lows on the S&P and seeing a little bit of a bounce on the NASDAQ composite. But you look at the NASDAQ composite, we didn't see as significant a bounce in the NASDAQ composite, the leadership index with the leadership stocks as we saw elsewhere. Why? Because those stocks are still pricey. So what retail was doing is they're buying the really beaten up stocks, all right, which makes sense. They already own a lot of the NASDAQ composite stocks that they want to own. So they don't need to buy more of those, but they're buying the other ones thinking if we get a bounce in here, these look really cheap right now. So this is how they trade. Not a problem. In fact, makes a lot of sense, except we're going to find out possibly um, what their breaking point is. So I want to see if you have any questions and I'm going to, I want to get into a whole bunch of charts. And as I'm searching for some questions, just want to go over some of the stuff that's moving markets this morning. We're, we're looking at, obviously the fed is everything and trying to figure out, you know, what the fed is going to do or not do, uh, whether we'll get stimulus or not. Uh, what did, uh, the comments mean last night? Um, and it's just a lot of tea leaf reading and uh, indecision. So that's where we are. On top of that, we get at 8.30 this morning, we get initial unemployment claims, continuing claims, et cetera. The um, initial unemployment claims for the past week uh, were, they were, they were less than expected. The, they came in at 790,021. That's 76,000 lower than the previous week. And that's the new uh, unadjusted number. The quote unquote seasonally adjusted number came in at 860,000 new claims for employment benefits on the week. That's still 33,000 less than the previous week. So either way, whether we're looking at the raw data or we're looking at the season data, um, we, we have something of an uptick in terms of fewer people lining up for initial unemployment benefits. Let me caveat that by saying 790,000 people in a week signing up for initial unemployment claims is a tremendous amount. That's last week. The week before, there were 76,000 more. The week before that, there were more. So the trend is getting a little better for sure, but when you think about every week, you're getting seven, eight hundred plus thousand people every week. And we're supposed to be on the other side of the recession. Really a problem. All right. That's the big picture. And this is what investors are starting to see as well. You know, yes, the trend is a little bit better for sure. But the, the raw numbers are staggering. Don't forget about 20 million people plus applied for initial unemployment claims since the pandemic started. We know what the unemployment figure got to, if we want to believe that. We know it's back down to like 8.4, if we want to believe that. Uh, but the bottom line is 790,000, let's go with the seasonally adjusted, 860,000 people last week applied for initial unemployment claims. The record before was 1982. 
when 665,000 people in a week applied. So we've been hitting well over that number every single week since the pandemic and since the worst of the pandemic, the worst of the initial claims passed and they were getting better. They were fewer each week. Still, the average, which is really around 840,000 a week, a week, every week, is staggering. And this is eventually going to weigh on a lot of people and weigh on a lot of investor minds as to what, what kind of recession um, are we in? Are we really climbing out of it? Um, and, and one of the things, probably the most disturbing thing, I think the implication of which yesterday was that maybe the Fed and the FOMC uh, members are increasingly apprehensive about the V-shaped recovery, the potential for a V-shaped recovery, and what that could mean, um, which is everyone is hoped for. So they've tried to be optimistic, but the numbers don't really pan out. Retail sales were down last month for, for August. Um, well, they were up, but they were half of what they were expected, um, half of what they were the month before. So just not good numbers. Are we moving out of the recession? Sure looks like it. I was talking to a hedge fund friend of mine yesterday who um, is out and about and does a lot of his homework out and about like in the old days, a lot of guys used to do. And he said he's, he's seeing things pick up everywhere where whether he's at malls or he's at uh, he went to some outlet stores to see what was going on. He said he couldn't even get in the stores. There was a, one, one of the Nike stores said there was probably a line of 30 people just to get into the store. So all of the stores he said were doing really well. He said the parking lots were full. He went to a bunch of other places and just said this seems like the people out and about went to restaurants. So that kind of on the you know boots on the ground work is is indicative of the fact that people want to get out and they're getting out, but are they spending enough? So we saw retail sales again up, but not um, as expected, and half of July. So. And don't forget, this is that's August. This is back to school sales. So again, not really a bright picture. So are the markets reflecting that? I think so. You know that I've been skeptical of the sell down and the dead cat bounce rally. And looking at the charts, you know why. And now we're seeing some confirmation of nervousness. And we're in that very strange place where I'm going to say it again. It's really going to be up to retail. If retail breaks and they start selling, um, may not be good. Institutional investors may start taking profits too. Because as we go into the election, we've only got 40 some odd days left. Um, investors, retail investors may move, but they may be on the sidelines. They may go to cash and kind of figure out um, you know, that it's probably smarter not to take the risks. That's possible. In that case, if there's really no buying support from retail, they don't buy the dip, big crowd nibbling around the edges, institutional guys are going to start taking profits. Okay, They could knock benchmarks down. That would bring in other sellers. That would certainly bring in retail folks who are sitting on positions. And most of them don't sit on positions very long, by the way. Most of them are sort of day trading, I would call it. Um, though, you know, if you're sitting on a profit, if they're smart enough, they're letting some of those profits run. Now those profits are in jeopardy because we're starting to do a turnaround. So that's where we're at. Got a couple of questions, and we're going to go to the charts. Uh, Ruby, should we be looking for puts on dividend stocks on the pullback? Um, if you have large positions in dividend paying stocks um, and I, I would look at them technically on a chart and see is there some breaking point where they could come down considerably, um, maybe you'd want to consider that. Um, you know, you also want to consider maybe buying some puts if you think we're going to get an ugly dip um, to make some money, not just to hedge. However, if you have really excellent stocks. Um, and hopefully you're not loaded to the gills, really you get a considerable dip in some of your good dividend paying stocks and you know that the payout ratio was you know, 40, 50, 60% and they've got plenty of cash flow and their net available to common holders is robust enough that they're going to continue to be able to pay those dividends. 
I would buy more. I, I would build my position because your yield is going to be higher as they come down. And if you like them long term and you're not worried about selling them or you don't need the money anytime soon, year two, three, then I would add. Buying puts, I, I would prefer to buy puts on things I think are going to fall out of bed. Then I can make some real money. Um, and then if I can make some real money on some of those positions, I'll, and then I'll go use that to buy some more of the dividend pink stock if I'm more inclined to have a, a fixed income type portfolio that's based on dividends. So Peter, Apple um, should head back up. Is there a buy point you like? Well, let's take a look at Apple. So this is a great day, everybody, for just throw some of your stocks at me uh, and we'll look at them together. Of course, we're going to look at Apple. We're going to look at all the FANG stocks, the majors, the benchmarks, as we always do. Um, but yeah, I, I think at some point it, there is going to be a buy, uh, Peter, for sure. And uh, because we know we've got the iPhone super cycle sale um, cycle coming up, um, the watch you know, we, 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 we remains to be seen when it goes on sale, I think. I'm not sure when it goes on sale. It might be Friday, might be tomorrow. I'm not sure. Um, if sales are good there, I actually, I'm going to take a look at it. And I don't own an Apple watch. I've never owned one of those watches. I've always thought they're brilliant a great idea the wearables i think are, are they're the future the future is here it's just a question for me as to do, what does it do that i need it to do so you know um blood oxygen count and some of the other things that it's doing now uh, they're, they're just getting better and better and as as the technology gets better battery life gets better etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah i i'm going to take a look at that because um, certainly need to be more conscious. We all need to be more conscious of our health. And if you can wear something that helps you do that, then great. So yeah, will I have a watch on one hand? Yes, because I'm an old school guy. Will I have a uh, <laughs> fancy tech watch on the other? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, who knows? I don't know that that's a trend because I'm sure there's a lot of people doing that. But um, yeah, why not? Makes a lot of sense. Maybe we can wear them on the same arm and, and you know, start. Maybe that would be the new trend. We'll see. Um, all right, so we keep, let's see, I'm just trying to keep up with these before we head into the screen for uh, some technical analysis. Uh, Peter, keep getting disappointed with gold and silver and miner. Should they uh, should they not head up uh, with market? Not to, um, we'll, we'll look, you know, again, I, I've said, and I'll repeat it, that if we see a market sell off, gold and silver will sell down. Why? Because you've got a lot of retail people, you've got a lot of investors who have been buying you know, the leadership tech stocks, they've been buying ETFs, they've been buying gold, they've been buying silver, and they've been buying GLD and SLV and, uh, and the miners. So again, and, and been buying Bitcoin and they've been buying everything because we've been rallying, everything's been in a rallying mode. Why? Because yeah, frankly, we're in the midst of an asset inflated bubble and this asset inflation courtesy of the fed is suddenly i've been worried about it for some time but it's now suddenly um drawing the attention of investors and analysts that, that you know uh, oh we are we were in an asset bubble uh yes the only real major inflation that the fed has triggered with its loose monetary controls is asset inflation we don't have any other staggering inflation we're going to start to see some inflation i think in foodstuffs in some of the ag sectors uh, and and elsewhere i think we have a bit of a, a bubble in housing i think the housing prices have gotten a little bit ahead of themselves but um certainly asset prices uh, financial asset prices have so um gold and silver are going to sell off because investors have bought them because they had a nice rep because the trend was up and everybody was looking at gold and silver as well. If the monetary authority is going to keep pumping up the, the printing presses and pushing money out, helicoptering it out, doing it any which way they could, then we're going to devalue currencies. We're seeing the, the dollar decline uh, and other currencies are going to be impacted. And what kind of regime is that going to lead to? Well, nobody knows. We, what we do know is gold's a safe haven. So we got that right now. The, the, shall we say, loose selling is um, a function of retail. It's a function of 
not long-term investors, but investors who have been playing the uptrend. So uh, I still like gold long-term. If you don't own it, then I think there's going to be some points to go in. And again, again, it's a longer term hold. It's probably a couple of years because we're going to, I think we're, the world is getting a little wacky. Um, and so gold, I think will hold its value. And I think it will increase um, as a store of value and as a trading instrument that folks were going to uh, rush to because they think it's going to appreciate in a world that's increasingly wacky. Um, so, but we'll, we'll take, certainly take a look at it. Uh, Michael, what indicate should be looking at that may indicate looming panic two weeks before the election? My guess is two weeks. It's anybody's guess, Michael. We're going to take a look at a bunch of indicators, the major stocks, the benchmarks, and we'll draw some uh, support lines and, and we'll look at all those. Uh, same idea on Amazon, Shelley's saying. Um, What's a good low buy price? Well, let's take a look at Amazon. We're going to look at all of those because uh, one of the reasons we're going to look at all of those is because the retail crowd is looking at all of those. They're looking for a place to buy back in. They are the, the really hardcore buy the dip crowd. And it's not just retail. It's a lot of other investors. It's us now. You know, Are we retail? Yes, we're part of retail, but we're not the new retail. We're not the new day traders that really um, came out You know, in in – March, February and March, April, May, and, and just opened up accounts. We've been doing this for a while, all of us, and certainly you know, some of us have investment accounts. Some of us are trading here and there. But at the end of the day, we are also um, chasing up stocks, and we should be because we momentum is a great way to trade. So, yes, all of those stocks, we're going to be looking at them because at some point – they're all great companies. We know that they come down. They're cheap enough. Everyone else is going to recognize that. And the retail is probably the, the day trading retail crowd is going to lead the way, start bidding them up. So, yeah, we'll probably look for places to go, get in some on the way down. Not when they start going up because when they go up, they're going to go up like that, like they did in March. Everybody knows that. The playbook is out there. We've already read it. Everyone's got a copy. Um, so, yeah, we'll take a look, at Michael. We'll take a look, Shelly, at, at, at all those. Uh, Michael W. Chai at 41. Uh, yeah, the OPEC discussions are ongoing. The hurricane-related uptick, that the hurricanes don't have a biggest impact as people think they do. Um, even if, if if platforms get taken out for a while, even knocked down, um, it doesn't really impact oil as much as other developments, mostly in the Middle East, um, with supply from the Middle East. Um, and elsewhere. So one of the things that's happening is that the, the U.S. frackers, uh, the shale businesses have all slowed down. And so we're starting to see some consolidation there. We're starting to see where there's a little bit of restriction in terms of the supply that was available previously. And that's giving people pause like, well, maybe it's time for oil to settle down, base out and maybe go higher. The bottom line there is that's certainly a narrative, but it's the oil moving up is predicated on global demand. And global demand seems to be firming up because there's a lot of optimism out there, including from the World Bank and IMF, in spite of some of the rhetoric, um, they're also trying to be more optimistic. Um, certainly the news out of China is, is positive. Uh, China's been is picking up its copper sales. It's, its demand for energy is picked up and not significant. It's picked up and not significantly. Certainly hasn't reached old levels by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so we're, we're going to be keeping an eye on those things. But as long as oil stays, uh, as WTI stays around 40 and doesn't crash, I mean, it can get down to 37 as it has recently, you know, 37, 42, 43 in that range is probably where it's going to base out until we see whether or not global demand is going to pick up or maybe we head back the other way. We got a double dip recession. There's just so much on the table. It's just really, it's a very difficult time to make a clear analysis um, that sees everything and, uh, Trying to see everything in this juncture with all of the things that are going on globally is, is virtually impossible. Uh, so, but we'll take a look at uh, oil, Michael. Uh, Peter's asking, uh, yes, RPTX. Let's take a look at that. Uh, you got a small position yesterday on a pullback. Okay. Uh, 
And we just let's just keep an eye on move over to quick scan of where we are because things are moving quickly. You know, we're we're trying to bounce back, um, but we're going the opposite direction. NASDAQ is now down uh 2.12%, which is lower than it was earlier in the day. Um, so let's just have a quick look. Um This morning, the, at the lows, uh, the Dow was down 375 points, 1.33 percent. Uh, it's heading back down there. We're not we're not on the lows. It's now down 0.88 percent. The S and P down 1.42 percent. At the lows this morning, it was down 1.59 percent. So we're heading in the wrong direction. And as far as the Nasdaq, it got hammered. It was down 2.26 on intraday lows, it's now down 2.13. So this, the bounce that we saw where the Dow got back to positive territory has pretty much evaporated and we're heading right back down. So time to look, look at all these, uh, all these stocks and uh, certainly look at RPTX. Uh, Peter, Europe is starting second wave of virus. Uh, do not see USA opening up travel soon. Travel should go lower if spreads more. Yes. And you know, again, a lot of the retail investors have been trying to bid up the hotel stocks and the travel stocks. Um, you look at Rolls Royce. Uh, Rolls Royce has been devastated, and I mean, it's a great proxy for the airline industry and how it's doing. Um, just and they're, they're raising; they need to raise more money, and their junk, their debt has been uh, um, has been cut to junk status. So, Rolls Royce, uh, you know, one of the premier engine makers uh, for for aircraft, absolutely hammered. So do, are, are there any, and we'll take a look at Boeing too. You know, Boeing, just the, the news, Boeing just, they just can't get out of their own way. Um, hi, Robin. Um, uh, LAC and STAG, we'll take a look at those. And I'm going to have a quick look, see if there's anything else. And then we're going to go, let's go look at these. All right, so let's go to the videotape. Give you a little share here. And... Hopefully, I'm on the old computer because I had a tech guy uh, for an hour and a half this morning, couldn't figure out the problems. So I just went back to the old computer. All right, let's go. What do I have up first? First, we are looking at TLT. And we're going to look at LQD um, and TLT first. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at the 20 year plus treasury bond. Uh, ETF. So it's a longer dated maturity where you're going to see a greater impact of in, on interest rate movements in the longer maturities. Uh, I really like to keep an eye on TLT. And one of my services, we just bought some calls on TLT. So it's going in the right direction for us. As you can see over here, you know, we're, we're, we've been hit the low. Again, came down to this support level and bounced off. Now, as yields go down, we know prices go up. So if yields are going down, TLT is going to rise. Now we get up here, you know, we're looking at the 10 year at probably, um, I would say 58, 59, is that 57, I should say, um, 58, 57, 56, 55, we'd be making new lows um, as far as that yield. And that would mean a flight to quality. So that would mean the markets are uh, creating a lot of nervousness and we're starting to see flight to quality. And if that extends to uh, Europe, Asia, elsewhere, um, again, we'll probably see a pickup in the, in the dollar because um, the United States is, you know, still may be the cleanest dirty shirt in laundry if we get, see, get into a global sell-off. So we're not anywhere near there yet. In fact, Europe held up very well today in spite of uh, trading down and then watching U.S. markets come unglued. Uh, European markets stayed, you know, they were off on the day, but not, not terribly so. So there's hope there that there's some resilience. But looking at the bonds, um, the expectation in our, on our purchase of calls on TLT is... To, is an assumption that we're going to see um, some some rate cuts um, 
not not because the Fed is going to cut them because they've cut to the bone, but investors are going to come in and bid up these bonds and that's going to bring rates down. So we're, we're expecting to see some a flood of money come into some of the, especially some of the ETFs, including TLT. Um, the other side of that, and it sounds a little contradictory and it may be a little contradictory to you guys, um, but it's not because LQD is the corporate investment grade ETF that we're watching and you're watching is if you're not you need to be why LQD because the Fed is, is buying LQD they don't they haven't you know, bought a lot of shares but LQD has, has been is one of on their um, on their list of ETFs that they're going to buy and that's to support the underlying bonds here's where the Fed announced that they were going to be buying some ETFs if they need to to support the market and they bought a small amount so here we go there's that big gap there now then there was a little bit of consternation well, they actually here's what happened was they didn't start buying all right they was like well wait a second I thought you were going to buy everyone thought okay the Fed's going to buy so we're going to get back up here we're going to go even higher and then the Fed didn't buy um but everybody was wondering, would well, you announce you're going to? Would then they started to talk more about it that they would, and then they started to they picked up a little. So investors got really pleased with that, decided to pile in and said, "Look, oh, they are buying, and just because we now know they've started, we know that they're true to their word, and eventually, if we have any kind of problem with investment grade stuff, there they're going to step in and buy bonds outright, and they're going to buy LQD. Why would they buy LQD?" Because they don't want the sponsors to have to sell the underlying bonds. If investors sold LQD, the sponsors of LQD would have to sell the underlying bonds because they're held in a trust. If investors sell LQD and then they don't want it anymore, then the sponsors are left with all the underlying bonds that they don't need because everybody gets owns a pro rata share of the portfolio. But they don't need those anymore, so they start to sell them. What the Fed is worried about is the selling of some of those illiquid corporates into a market that's declining for corporate bonds, putting pressure on corporate bonds. They're, they're saying, well, we'll step in and we'll buy the shares so the sponsors don't have to liquidate the underlying bonds. That sounds good, but in reality, they just can't buy enough LQD because LQD alone is not going to hold up corporate bonds. So investors thought, Brilliant. Wrote it all the way up. Okay. Really nice high. And that's because everybody was searching for yield and they also traded this. This is a price appreciation here in LQD. So they were making money on price appreciation. Now we come back down, we come back down to this support, which is now support level. Okay. So here's the old high and here's support. If we break down through this support, that means that People are selling LQD. There are net selling, is net selling going on in LQD. If the Fed doesn't come in and support it, and there continues to be net selling, and we get down below this support, and we come down anyway, investors are going to start to panic. So, but where's the Fed? How come LQD is coming up? If the Federal Reserve, with its unlimited balance sheet, isn't supporting this or if they are even worse and they're still net selling holy mackerel things are really bad and it must be all kinds of selling elsewhere so this is a benchmark i want us to all watch we've come down through here uh, on lqd we're talking about one we're talking about 134.50 thereabouts 134.75 um you know around so somewhere in there we're at 135.86 now, so we don't have a long way to go to start to be a little nervous. We break down there, and we're already below the 50-day moving average, okay? So just be careful. You break down through here, that means something is going on, and there's net selling of corporates, of high-grade corporates, and the Fed isn't holding them up. Warning. We get down here, okay? Wow. Um, that's not good news. So be very and in, in here. Be very keep keep an eye on this. Use this as a benchmark to see how things are going in the corporate world. We get down here, 
Um, and you'll feel it elsewhere. You'll feel it in the equity market. You'll feel it. You'll see it probably in gold selling off a little bit. Because again, if we get that, if this is what's happening and corporates are being sold, um, we got problems. We got an equity for, for sure will be selling off if these bond, if LQD is selling off. So there you go. You got TLT to watch and LQD. Now let's go down the list real quick of the majors. We'll start off with the Dow. It's going to hit all these real quickly because we're looking for where is their support? Where are we going? Where could we go? And how do we know? All right. So we here we have our are set up from before um, here we go here's our uptrending channel which we've spoken about we've broken through there we're now below that we haven't come down to the 50 day yet on the dow but we see we've got some we've got support right across here and we are coming right down to it today we broke it through it before so it wouldn't be surprising to get down here it's on the lows and the dow at you know maybe 27 you know 450 440 it's 27 450 in there so we don't 27 for yeah, 440 450 yeah don't don't be surprised if we get down there the question there is we'll be at the 50 day and will it hold because there's some support there all right below that we don't have a lot of support there's just not a lot of support we're going to see some incremental support maybe down at 27,000 thereabouts so again that's another 800 840 points below here um, but we start cracking those psychological numbers. You know, we crack 29 very easy on the way down. We crack 28 pretty easily. Uh, if we crack 27 and we're into 26 and 26,000 handle, uh, that's going to start making a lot of people very nervous very quickly. So keep an eye on that. It's it's not an attractive um, setup, but it's not as bad as the NASDAQ, which we will get to. But first, S&P, here's your institutional benchmark. This is what everybody's watching on the institutional side of things. So again, not a pretty picture, all right? Here's, we have it in green now. There's your uptrending lower channel market. It goes all the way up to there, right? We're way, way below that channel. Here's the other side of that channel. No, we wanna be in here. We wanna be get, we wanna get back up in here and moving in here. As I said the other day, I don't think stocks have the energy to get back up there. That's a lot of buying. Going into the election with the great unknowns, who's going to commit? Institutions are not going to lead that charge, period. It has to be retail. And if retail backs off, there's no way we're going to get back up there. We're going to come back down and test this. Oh, we're already pretty much we're pretty close to that on the S and P. All right, we're at um, three thousand three thirty nine on the bar charts right now, which is a, which is delayed. We're actually at three thousand three thirty three, a little bit lower, and we've got three thousand seven. So let's use three thousand as a benchmark, right? So we get three thousand three hundred. Um, there's your. If we get down to three thousand three hundred, people are going to get worried because we're breaking through that support. Okay, that means we'll have been through support. That means we'll we'll be below the 50-day considerably, and we'll be well below the channel, and people are going to get very nervous. So again, can this change? Of course it can change. But I don't see it changing. I don't see the impetus for buying. I, I don't see it. I know, I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm telling you, I'm a former institutional trader and also running hedge funds. You don't take risks like that. You don't lead the market higher as institutional investor. And if you're a mutual fund manager, you don't go in buy now, buy this dip. That's not your job to buy this dip. Your job is not to get slaughtered if things go down more. Your job is not to try and push the markets up so, so what you have looks better. You, you know, you're the oh, oh no position right now. Oh no, I hope it doesn't get worse but you're not going to add more money and look stupid and lose money on the way down. So it's not going to come from institutional guys, right? And a lot of them, on the other hand, the hedge funds and bank trading desks, a lot of them are trying to short into this and trying to push the market down, okay? That's what I'd be doing. Um, running a hedge fund, I'd be trying to push this down. I'd be placing a lot of bets with very tight stops and trying to push the market down as much as I could 
and try and catch that ride down. So here we are. We're really, we're right here. We're below the 50-day on the NASDAQ, well below it. So this whole bar is below it, opened up below it today. Believe me, people know that. That's why the NASDAQ composite has not been able to rally um, as the Dow attempted. Uh, it just didn't really see it. It had a little pop higher, but never anything like the Dow. Certainly get, didn't get anywhere close to being even on the day. Flat. It was never. It never had a chance. Can it resume that attempt later in the afternoon? Sure. Doesn't look really promising right now. Below the fifty, right at support. Okay, right here at support. If anything, tad below it. So, what happens if we close below this this support right here, which is we'll call that uh, ten thousand. Uh, actually, we're going to go a little below. We're going to actually draw that support at 10,825. So we're already below it, okay? But we can give it a little wiggle room because we have this bar below it too. So you know, below it is okay for now, as long as we don't fall further. We'd like to see it stay there close to this support line. We'd love to see it get above there if you're bullish. Um, but if not... If we stay down here and get a little lower, we're going to start to trade in this range in here. Okay, that's where we're going to be. That's a big sell-off. It's a big drop down there. It's a huge drop. Okay, we're going to be down 15% if we get down to here easily um, more. So that's going to make a lot of investors very, very nervous. So this sideways action wouldn't surprise me to see the market move sideways going into the election down here with a low of maybe 10,200. That's a big move for the NASDAQ. Um, could we break 10,000 and go down to the 9,000 range? Well, yeah, yeah, we actually could because it's not that far down because here we are we're pretty much right there. So could we do that? That's not that far below. Yeah, that next support if easily. That would freak everybody out. So be very careful. That's the whole point of this exercise. Um, Again, this is a setup we talked about for two weeks now. Um, it's a setup to the downside. Again, um, just no conviction out there. So let's let's hit the the fangs real quick. Facebook, uh, not having a great day. Um, okay, um, so pretty much on the lows of the day um let's see lows today uh, intraday uh 254 oh right at the lows okay making new lows as we speak not good down below this support obviously crashed through this support um and now that's resistance now we're below this support here at 260 okay so below 260 we're, we're below the 50 day not good, ladies and gentlemen. Next support, 247. Can we get there? In about a wink of an eye, okay? Really, next support for Facebook of any of any consequence is a good bit lower, which will freak a lot of people out when probably somewhere around here we've got some support, okay? So that's a long way down. That's 225, we'll call it, 225, 227 range, all right? So that's gonna, now we're coming back down towards the highs way back here before we crapped out on the coronavirus, uh, right? So bang, really worked our way out quickly, really fab, fabulous move. Now, are we giving this all back? We're in danger of doing that. we got a lot of space in here, so be careful. Investors are looking at this. They're like, well, I'm not going to commit to that. Certainly, <clears throat> like Facebook, if I missed it on the way up, I certainly hope it craps out so I can buy it a lot lower because I want to buy it. And if you own it and you haven't taken your profits, you're thinking, oh, boy, I'm letting them slip away. If you bought it anywhere along here and anywhere along here, right about now, you're thinking, uh-oh, I'm, I'm, I'm about flat. Time to get out. I don't want to start losing money. This is what's happening. This is what investors are looking at now. They're at that place where they're starting to break even or lose. Now, Apple. It's got the, the iPhone coming out. And, you know, if sales aren't good, the stock's going to take a tumble. 
So they better be good. The watch sales better be good. All right. The iPad sales better be good. You know, and they're expected to be good because we got the back to school. We've got love work from home and school from home. And so some of you know, those products are supposed to do well. And the super cycle upgrade to the new phones should do well. If they don't, the ride for Apple may be open for a while. Okay. Buying opportunity. I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't buy right now. <clears throat> I could be dead wrong, but for me, I'm going to wait to see if we can come down to this area down here, down to 100, right? Because there's nothing, there's nothing. We're below the 50 day. There's nothing really holding us, this stock up right here. There's, see, there's nothing. Let me just draw a quick little something for you here, and you'll see what I mean. There's nothing here. We draw these lines not because we like to draw lines, it's because it's what other investors are looking at. Other investors are looking at these technicals too. And they're on people's computers. They're on their watch list, and they're and they're on their alerts. Okay, so people trade off of these, right? It's not tea leaves. These are psychological levels. People come down again. Here's the whole story. All right, if you bought it here, you had a great ride. You're absolutely thrilled to death. And uh, obviously, this is post this um, four for one split, and and you're really happy because you've made a lot of money. And right now, you start to come down here. It's like, well, wait a second. I already gave up a lot. And where did you get in? At some point, if you got in around here, you're at break even. You're nervous because you start losing money. So, so if you got in down here, you started thinking, how much have I given up by not selling up here? Well, good luck if you did up there. You're a genius. But um, that's where the psychology comes in. That's where technical analysis comes in. That's where this line gets drawn because people are looking at them going, oh, boy, um, I wasted a lot of money. I had a lot on this trade, and maybe I just I don't want to lose it. Oh, but it's Apple. I'll buy more. Maybe if I don't own Apple, I'm going to wait to get down to 100. I'm going to see it get down to 100. I'll take my first chunk at 100. Thank you very much. I'll be very happy with 100. And if it goes lower, I'm holding for the long term. I like it. But really, my next chunk in the 80s. You know, maybe I pick up a little bit. You know, something around 90. Only because if I like the market, I certainly would pick it up. If I think the market is, we've come down too far too fast, and I think there's going to be the buy the dip crowd is going to at some point pounce. Yeah, I'm going to try and pick up some, and, and I don't mind a risk because I think you could have a really nice trade. So yeah, I, I that's my call right there. All right, I like it at a hundred thereabouts, give or take. Uh, my first chunk. If I'm if you don't own it, if you own it. And you you, know, you got a profit here. It's a long term hold. Yeah, stick with it. But I'm I got my trading hat on right now because the market's just acting kind of weird. Really would have expected the buy the dip crowd to have already moved in a little bit. And it doesn't mean that they won't move in quickly because if they do, they they're quick to come in. And then institutions will probably follow them in. Not at first. It's going to take a couple of days, and then they'll jump on. And we'll get an upside move. Um, but that hasn't happened yet. Because what we want to see, when when we know there's a buy the dip crowd in and it's going to be, the, the move is sustainable, we're going to see it happen for a few days. The first day is going to be typical. It's like going to be a big pop. And then the second day, if you don't see follow through, then guess what? That was just, that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for a follow through second and the third day. And if you got in, you're happy. Take the risk. Get in if you see that pop. But be very, very diligent about getting out if we turn back around. But it's a good place to get in to try and buy those dips because it, it works. Amazon, right? Amazon is doing, whether you realize it or not, it's it's making political moves. It's making growth moves for sure, but it's making political moves. And Jeff Bezos knows and the team knows that there's going to be, there may be a regime change, change and there's going to be some stuff and it's going to weigh on Amazon for sure, for lots of reasons, right? Is Amazon, could Amazon be attacked and broken up? Yes. Is it going to happen anytime soon? No, it's going to take a good long effort um, of antitrust to go after Amazon. I don't, I wouldn't care if I owned Amazon because the sum of the parts is greater than the whole, in my opinion. All the pieces come together are just so different and so fabulous. They just work beautifully together, but separate, they would be just as powerful. Some of them would be even more powerful. So I wouldn't care if they broke up Amazon if I owned it. I'd be like, hey, just give me give me some tracking stock of each of the pieces and I'm a happy camper. But here we are, broken down. 
right? So we had some support over here. And where are we? Right through it, all right? So let me just redraw that. But Amazon is you know, going to hire 100,000 people. That's political, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, what are you going to do? Open up in 1,000 warehouses around the country. And what everyone thinking, 1,000 warehouses, okay, that's more employment. And that's great. They're here to stay, and they're going to be part of the community. It's very political. Why do you think they're coming out with this now? Right? They don't want to be under attack. Investors are fleeing. Okay, That's an ugly gap down here. Well below. It's been trading below its 50-day. And there we are. So, yeah, I like Amazon. What I, I don't own it in here. All right. I've long since looked at Amazon, taking profits, and I'm waiting for it to come back down. Okay. So great ride up. I think was, I think we could come down here, and our next real support. Let me just look up my door. The gardeners are out there. Too nice today not to have all the doors and windows open. Um, so we've got support here. And if I'm going to take a shot on Amazon to start a, a new position, I'm going to see if it can come back down here. 29.91. Okay. So we're already in there, right? We're heading down towards there. So that's where I'll take my first chunk of Amazon. Take a 20% position um, on a new position I want to accumulate. And then I don't really care if it falls over. more. I'll average down. If it comes down here, if it comes down here, I'll average down because I want, I'm want. i a long-term holder. I'm happy to buy back here and accumulate another position. And if it comes down lower, I'll accumulate more. Right. So that's how I'm going to play Amazon and Apple. I'm looking for these levels to take my first piece to accumulate another position. And this time... Um, you, I probably this. I don't know that the rush higher this time is going to be as dramatic as it was in March. In fact, I don't think it's going to be. So it's just a matter of getting in long enough. I mean, just getting long enough, owning enough where you're happy and saying, "Okay, I don't worry about it now for the next couple of years." And you'll get, you'll have a great couple of years. There's your Amazon, Netflix. Um, just not having a great day. Um, and Netflix has been kind of, you know, off the radar. It's part of the Fang stock, but it's the, it's the end that, you know, no one's paying a whole lot of attention to. I punched up the wrong thing, sorry. And it's just, it's fallen out of favor. Um, it's been replaced by Microsoft had a long time ago and other stocks. But you can see, you know, here it is. We talked about this. Looks like a double top. We got a little bit of a neckline here. We've broken that neckline. Again, if you like Netflix, give it time. You, you'll, be, you'll get to own it cheaper, I think. Um, wouldn't surprise me to see Netflix come come down all the way down here. Um, again, we you know, could it come down to 410? Yeah. All right. So you don't be in a rush to buy Netflix. Microsoft. Well, let's go to Google first since we're rounding out the fangs. Sorry, the fingers aren't working that well today. Computer's a little slow. Same story, right? Trading range, right? Through the uptrend, whether you want to draw a recent uptrend or a longer term uptrend, I don't care which one you draw. You can even draw from all the way down here. And if you would have used those two points, you know, you, you could do that. And you're still on the underside of what you could consider would be the, the channel. Uh, the support, all right? You're, you, however you want to look at it, you can draw that. You're below it, okay? Considerably below it, below considerably below the 50-day, gap down, and coming back down to this support here at around, we'll call it uh, 1455 thereabouts, somewhere right along here, okay? So we're, somewhere along there, we got some support. But guess what? 
what looks a little scary for Google, for Alphabet, is now we're below the highs, all right? The February highs. So February, all-time highs, coronavirus, recovery, spectacular, ah, oh, right back to here. Nice move up, but not as nice as the other stocks in terms of the gains that others had seen. And now, first one to come back down, first one to fall below its February highs, okay? First of the leadership stocks to do that, all right? Breakdown, right? So Google, I'm not in a rush to buy Google because Google hasn't been in as impressive as the other stocks. So be careful on Google. Softy, survey says. One of my favorites, looking for a place to re-enter. So I'm out of I'm out of everything. Um, I got a couple of positions on, and I'm looking now to re-enter because I, I talked to you guys about I'm seeing this breakdown. Time to exit. And so if you did, good for you. Um, I'm substantially in cash and I'm looking to re-enter. Okay, what do I see here? Complete breakdown, okay? Complete breakdown. And so here, 200. Mm, we got here too quickly for me to just jump in. I wanna see where we go, right? I, I said, but now here's where back here, is where the previous highs were at 191 and change. We we'll call it nice. We we'll go to the actual bar. We'll tell you what it was. So the that high was 190.70. Okay, and that's the intraday high, right? So that old intraday high, um, we're at 200 now, right? No reason for this stock to find some support here and bids come in and buy people are going to wait to see if it comes back down just like they did with google that they're going to do with google and google google did break below its previous highs so this is what i'm worried about this is destruction short term as it may be that has occurred and there's a lot of profits have been given up there's a lot of there's a lot of big reversal here so I've uh, been dragging on and trying to show you guys a little bit of everything. Let's just go real quick to the other stocks you want to talk about with gold. Okay, what's happening with gold? Um, we got some cross asset selling, nothing major in gold. But if you look at the chart, you know, we have a little bit of uptake. This is okay. We, this, this descending triangle, we just don't want to come down below what we'll call 170, we'll call 179, okay? We don't want to come down below 179. So as long as GLD stays up here, we're 182 and change. Um, you know, it can go up because it, it wouldn't surprise me to come down here if we see some cross asset selling, some margin selling. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if we even broke that. Um, it, it'd be a little scary because we could then come down to like the 170 level very quickly because there's not a lot there. If it came down to one, GLD came down to 170, buy it. All right. If we hit some just massive sell-off and margin selling knocks the retail traders, a lot of investors out of GLD because they're getting margin calls elsewhere and maybe in GLD, then it could come down. I'd buy it in there. I'd certainly buy a position in there. Uh, longer term hold in GLD. Yes. So that's where GLD's at. Um, silver. SLV. Talked about silver being more volatile and, and continues to be a bit more volatile than uh, GLD. And sync, similar pattern, okay? So again, um, some cross asset selling could see GLD get down to like 24, um, you know, maybe break 24, uh, 390, 2390 range. That's you know, not out of the question and could happen very quickly. Um, but then again, you know, if it, if it holds there, then when we could see um, some, not flight to quality necessarily, but this is a one of those trades where it's like if gold's going up and silver's cheaper, we'll go into silver too. So we could see some retail. But 
danger zone. You got a lot of, there's a lot of, there's nothing here. This is thin. This is very thin, spotty trading. And silver scares me in terms of this volatility in here. Silver could very easily come back down here because there's a lot of bets, a lot, of, a lot more leverage bets on silver than there are on gold. Okay. So it wouldn't surprise me and it would scare, it should scare you too, if silver just free falls because it could do it. Again, it, this is a spectacular move up. This is a good consolidation phase here and could go up, but it also could break down. If it breaks down, yeah, I don't want to be a holder here. I don't want to be even tested. I want to see how low it can go and see what market conditions are. Um, but because this is held by a lot of retail as a trade and a lot of leveraged bets on SLV, um, it, it could flush out. And let's see what I've got. I'm going to take a look at RPTX. Care Therapeutics. And okay, you got into this today on a dip. Good for you. you got a nice little move today as the market's going down. Um, very nice. Hang on to it. But it just, um, I don't know exactly what they do or what the news is, but certainly looks good. But keep in mind, you know, what goes up. So this is pretty ugly. That's pretty cool. Doesn't mean that won't happen again. We saw how fast that happened. So don't be greedy. Put stops in there. You know, you can always go back in and, and buy more if it dips. Um, but give it a little room to move. And I would say just don't leave your profits on the table if it turns around. But good for you. You're making money. That's it's always a good day. Lithium America's Corp. Okay. Um, lithium. Everything is lithium. Um, wow. Um, pretty nice move. Uh, really, all I got to say about this is, uh, you know, lithium is is it. It's the you know, tag, you're it. And uh, this has um, had a really good run. Um, if you own it, I wouldn't sell it. It could get a little volatile. We could come down here. We could trade down here. It's a pretty extensive move. Um, but, yeah, I would I would hold this long term. And for those of you who don't own it, if you get a dip back down to six, which would be a big drop if you own it, um, but if you don't own it, you're looking for a place to enter. If we get a sell-off, all boats will probably get a little hit. Um, six six bucks is where you want to enter that one. Um, but right now, stay with it. Just mind your stops. Mind your stops. Because sometimes the tide goes out. And we see who's been swimming naked. You don't want to get caught. Right? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but... I just don't want to leave money on the table. Boeing, you know, one of those industrial companies that I you, I love, but I don't own it. Um, you know, I back down. You know, I was advocating. A couple of hedge fund friends would ask me about it, and I and I said, you know, two hundred, I'd be a buyer. They called me two hundred. They bought some. And then they were screaming at me when we got down here because I said, well, you know, you know, buy 150. And they bought more at 150. And then they screamed at me. And then they got down here and they said, what would you do? And I said, buy it, buy it at 100. And they bought more at 100. Then when they got back up here, they called me up and said, oh, so glad we averaged down. Um, now, I don't know what they're doing. They haven't called me. Um, but hopefully they're taking their profits. But this is, this is why I didn't buy it because – you know, on the way down, I, I was like, yeah, well, if we got here, that's not good. Um, I'm not comfortable. This setup just doesn't isn't conducive to get in, right, at 200. It wasn't conducive to get in. I wanted to get in at 150. I really wanted to get in at 150. This, this, I'm looking at the chart. I'm looking at the action. I'm like, you know, at some point it's going to stop, but I, I don't know where. Down at 100 is really where I should have committed something, but I didn't because at that point I was like, well, if it did all this and this and this, it could go lower. And, of course, it did go a little lower. Now, this is really where we're at. I think you're going to get a chance to buy Boeing. You know, maybe I might buy, um, I might buy a slice at 150. We're going to, we're, I think we're going to get there. Market continues down. We'll, we'll see 150 on Boeing. And um, that may, may take a small piece there and maybe look to buy some at 125, some at 100. And my last piece, you know, down if it gets if it gets down there. But I want to own Boeing at some point for a long 
term trip higher, long term trip. Um, but I'm not in any rush. And frankly, I may not even buy it at 150 because if we get down here and we break that, then that's because things are worse in the airline industry. And I'm not sure that I want to own Boeing um, for a while longer. Um, so again, this is the, these are the the, the this is the conversation you have with yourself when you're looking at a stock that you want to own, the company that you want to own, why? Because it's a duopoly for the most part, and you know you don't don't need to be in a rush. You, you know, so oh, when it, when it was down when I 100 and I got up to you know 200 and change, I felt like an idiot. It's like what well, completely? I just like well, I it's, I think it's done. I, I I just don't see it. I don't I don't get it. I still don't get it. And sure enough, I was glad I didn't buy in on this move up, All right? So will we get a chance lower? I think so. And uh, let's see, I think we got one more. And then uh, kept you guys a lot longer than I should have. So my apologies. Um, STI. Looking pretty good. A little bit of a rollover, so make sure your stops are in place. You know, here's your previous high. Now you've broken down through that. So um, as far as STS, just be careful. Um, I, I would have some stops in place because this is a heck of a ride up, and it could very easily just sell off. Um, but if you've ridden it up, good for you. But, but be careful up there because um, – at some point, people are looking at people who, you know, bought it, owned it all the way here. Watch this happen. They got, they were happy they saw this happen. There are people that got in down here for sure. Happy they got up. And then guess what? You know, now we're everyone's at the same place. It's like, well, if this comes back down, um, is this all safe? And how much lower could it go? You know, right here, you'd think the longer term would be, you know, around 30. And surprisingly, not that far off there, okay? So you got some support down, way down there. But uh, below that, that gets really scary. So mind your stops on that. Uh, I, think, I think I covered all of them for you guys. Going out, let's take a look. Okay, Dow's trying to bounce once again. Um, it's down... 0.78. Don't forget, earlier in the day, it was at 1.33%. That's the low. I'm not sure if it made a new low. No, it didn't. Uh, S&P um, may have made a lower low. It was down 1.6%. It's down 1.29%. Um, NASDAQ, um, you know, off of its lows, uh, but it did turn back down. Um, so it was down 2.26. Um, it's now down 2%. So, um, and it's heading back down right now. Where are we going to go? I don't understand um, the bullishness that that some investors I speak to um, are 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 sure of. Um, I, I don't see it. I don't. I don't try and anticipate. I try and just pretty much look at the facts, read the facts, and a lot of those facts are evident in the charts in terms of what investors are doing. That that tells a story. Uh, you can listen to the narrative, and narratives are great. Um, especially when they're positive, uh, but when the narratives become sloppy and nobody really knows, then it's time to take profits, plain and simple. The narrative uh, could turn ugly, and um, by the time you realize that, that the new narrative is things are as good as we thought, things are already will have sold off. So narratives are great. We're going to talk a lot more about narratives. I'm going to start trading a lot on narratives because narratives are fantastic. We, a lot of us intuitively trade on, trade on narratives, um, and that's good. So uh, let's see a couple quick questions going out real quick. I've got a bunch of them. I'm going to try and hit them real quick. I'll pull up my other computer so we don't have to go back to the screen. And, uh, okay, so Shelly, I addressed Amazon WTI at 41. We talked about that. Uh, we talked about Peter's stocks. Um, U.S. Open, yeah, travel, Peter, same thing. I don't, I don't, I don't see it. We looked at Boeing as representative of travel in terms of planes um, and demand. Robin, uh, we talked about that. Nick, short them. Uh, Short-term thoughts on Nvidia and shop. Oh, good one. Okay, Nvidia. <clears throat> okay, so 
<clears throat> as I'm looking up NVIDIA real quick, you know, we're in bubble territory. We, when you, when Snowflake comes out yesterday, this is a company that loses money. All right, I, I, the metrics are good because it's on a trajectory similar to some other stocks that have done phenomenally well since they IPO'd. Uh, so I get that. Uh, but to double the first day, uh, that's, a, that's a bit irrational. Um, you didn't get in. We you know the people who, who bought um, Snowflake yesterday, they didn't get in the way Warren Buffett got in, right? They, they didn't. So you're not getting that. You're, you're, <laughs> You made them a lot of money. And by you, I'm meaning the folks that chased it up yesterday. Uh, NVIDIA. NVIDIA is, you know, with the, the whole AD, um, whether they're going to get ARM, you know, remains to be seen. And I think that's going to be, it's not a done deal. Um, so right now, this 470 is for support. If it gets down to 470, um, and you want to take some profits, I, I, you can't be faulted for taking profits at 470 um, and look for a place to get back in. Again, if the market turns really ugly, NVIDIA is going to come down. All of these stocks, because of their ascent, the trajectory of their ascent, uh, so many people on the way up are looking, looking, looking as to where, where am I going to get out before I start getting back all my profits or, oh my gosh, I am break even. Oh my gosh, if it ticks down, I'm losing money. So this is what we're going to have on the way down. So that's where we're at in NVIDIA 470. I see support there. Hopefully it stays there. I like NVIDIA long term. If it comes down lower, I would love it um, at you know 316, 320 in there. Give it a shot. I don't think we're going to get down there. Uh, let's see. Shopify also, yeah. Um, another another great company, you know, just what they do. I mean, I really like what, what um, Snowflake does. They're, they're just a brilliant setup for a cloud. You, know, you can access the cloud through everyone else's cloud. So um, really smart. Um, but is it worth double um, and it loses money? No. Not right away. It's going to earn that. Shopify, ugly rollover. Shopify, broken down. Um, it broke down at 890. Um, we're at 854 now. Again, this is one of those stellar stories. It's still a great company, but it got way ahead of itself. Um, you got some support at eight, uh, 783. That's a long way down. Um, but you're through support right now. You're below um, the 57 and 21. Um, be careful on Shopify. If you got profits, and, uh, no harm in taking them, unless you think we're going to see a big turnaround, in which case Shopify probably, to a lot of folks, will look like a buy. Um, but be careful. Um, Shelly is asking, do you think we could see the March dip levels again anytime soon? Uh, I, could we? Yes. Do I think we will? No, we always could um, because mechanically there's just been a lot of buying and a lot of leverage buying and there's a lot of profits on the table. So, but there's a lot of solid, a lot of the companies that have led are solid companies. So we look at the, the, the five stocks that became more than about 25% of the S and P um, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, and they're all great companies. So are they going away? No, they're not going away. Is Apple worth $2.5 trillion? No, uh, it's not even, I think it's down below 2 trillion. Is, is Apple really worth $2 trillion? No. So these companies got inflated. And some of that could, the, the air is coming out of the bubble. Um, how much? So we'll see. It, it may not be a lot. The buy the dip crowd is out there. At some point, they're going to come back in. That's why I don't think we're going to get anywhere near the March lows. However, mechanically, entirely possible. Mechanically, because of the way the markets operate, um, a lot of triggers could be met in terms of stops. Um, and then we start to get into that whole margin selling. We start to get into that negative feedback loop. Is that possible? Of course it's impossible. People who say it's not impossible, they don't remember how many times it's happened. I do. I've been through a lot of those times. Okay? So I know it can happen. And anybody who thinks it doesn't, they're the ones they're probably going to get. 
um, turned upside down when it does. So yes, is it possible? Yes, probable at this juncture, no. Um, we're a long way off from that happening. Uh, and, and that's partly because we're looking at uh, maybe a vaccine sometime soon. I think that's going to give support to the market. So, you know, there's so much talk every which way, sideways about a vaccine. And uh, I don't know how we even determine the efficacy of a vaccine or the different ones that are coming out from different countries. It's a mess. And there's no... Uh, there's no funnel through which all of that information comes to us in, in, a, in a way that we can trust. So um, we get vaccines, a vaccine, several vaccines. Um, I don't. I won't rush out to get injected. Um, we'll talk about that tomorrow, uh, and I'll tell you why. Because I there's a there's a good reason. And if you haven't thought about it, um, remind me tomorrow. I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, 200-day moving averages. Yeah, you know, Shelly, 200-day moving averages are important. When the 50-day crosses under the 200-day, then that a lot of investors take note of that. Certainly all the, uh, the uh, technical traders take note of that. Um, but it just becomes um, really obvious that things have broken down. Uh, and the trend, that's, a, that's indicative of just a, you know, a, a serious trend change where the short-term trend is just like, uh-oh, it's really negative. Um, is that sometimes a settling spot? Yes, it can be. Um, but given the rapid ascent in March, since March, this time we don't know. We'll see. So yeah, keep an eye on, on the 200-day moving averages for your stocks and certainly the indices, and um, keep an eye on the 50-day crossing under the 200-day. Um, again, if you start to see that happening, uh, make sure you have your your profit targets set up. Make sure you have your stops in. Make sure you don't leave money on the table. The all you can always get back in. And uh, Michael Espinelli's never apologized. Appreciate your time and thoughts. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate you guys always sticking around with me and uh, making this worthwhile. Thanks very much. Be safe out there. and I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Cheers.